Let's take a look at Andy Pettit's move. It's a borderline balk. I mean, you could probably call it either way. If this front foot goes past the rubber, which is where his left foot is, then it's a ball. He has to go to the plate. Now, is that past the past it or not? I mean, from this angle, it looks like it could be. See how he steps to even have to throw it over that way, and that's why he was able to pick Martinez off. But there's no excuse to be picked off when you're down by two runs. You're not going any place. You have to make sure he throws to the plate. Good job by Pettit to get away with it, or just that's part of his move. Edgar Martinez, who hasn't played the field with any regularity at all, so he's been on base a lot. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just pointing out that he is a spectator now that his his team is back out on the field. He yeah. watches from the dugout as a DH. He played three games this year at first base. Tino Martinez, who applied the tag on him on the pickoff, takes a strike, one and one. He's on base as much as anyone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but he still got picked off. That's, again, you can't make. I think it's more just concentration. He just lost his concentration. Because everyone knows Pettit has a great move. The Mariners know it. And you have to be cautious when you're at first base. I'm surprised that Andy threw over there with Martin, with Edgar at first. Now, Tino Martinez rips it foul. Two balls and two strikes. I think we were on separate tracks there. Yeah. Speaking no, no, of tracks, I, yeah. here comes the train. <laughs> whistling off in the distance but just talking about Edgar as a DH yeah, and the possibility yeah. of their making the World Series he'd be able to DH here at home and reduce the pinch hitting duties in the National League Park. You can see the train through the uh, the opening there in right center field. If you're Aaron Seeley you're going to have to try to find some rhythm because I believe Andy Pettit has found his rhythm. He threw the ball better last inning than the entire ball game. And Tino Martinez Hits this one hard but foul. So it's still three and two. And you're going to have to find your rhythm with your fastball. You're going to have to move it around a little better. Make sure you get ahead. And then you're going to have to throw the curveball where it bounces almost. He's throwing the curveball and he's hanging it. You start the curveball in the strike zone and let it break out. That's when you're successful with two strikes on the hitter. But that's what he has to do more of. Use the fastball. Set them up. You see the target there from Oliver was up and in, and he, that's where he threw the ball. Now watch the target. Watch where he puts it. He wants it up and inside, and he throws it there. And this one has popped up. Good thing in the shallow left is Rodriguez to take it. in game two and a homer in the second inning of this game is retired to start the fourth bringing up Posada who struck out in his first at bat the switch hitting catcher at 28 home runs this year grounds it to McLemore two out of the New York fourth This is what Seeley needs. He needs a one, two, three inning so he can get his confidence back. Some boos greet Paul O'Neill. He's going to generally be an unpopular player when on the road because he's so demonstrative with his emotions. So he's an easy guy to get on. If he's your player, you appreciate him for his commitment and his passion. If he's an opposition player. He's an easy target. Popped up his first time. Grounds this one foul. Paul used the relatively heavy bat by today's standards. Most of your sluggers use 32 ounces, even 31 ounces. Paul's is about 34, 35 ounce bat. You'd be surprised at a lot of these big strong guys using the real light bats but I think this is the, the approach they take to hitting now they want to be able to wait and be quick foul back on two. most modern hitters use a bat that's thin from the knob up to around the area of the trademark and then most of the weight is in the meat end of the bat and the top is puffed out getting rid of some useless weight 
And they're able to get more of a whip action with it. Sealy's 0-2 pitch. He reached for it, rolls it harmlessly to McLemore, and Sealy gets that 1-2-3 inning you were talking about, Joe, to the bottom of the fourth at Safeco. 3-1 New York. With the injured umpire Randy Marsh having been replaced for game three by Field and Colbert, they changed the umpire rotation. So let's reset them for you. Mark Hirschbeck has home plate, and we'll pick up the rest after this pitch, which is hit up the middle by Olerud for the seventh Seattle hit. Every one of them a single. So just to finish, Wally Bell is the umpire at first. Jerry Davis is at second. John Hirschbeck, Mark's older brother, is the umpire at third. Angel Hernandez is in left field. And the new umpire, Fielden Colbreth, calls the plays down the line and right. Randy Marsh, it turns out, had a broken bone in his left arm and tried to just grit it out the first two games of this series. Got to give him credit for that. Then the pain became too great. The Mariners needed that base hit from Olerud in the first inning, they could have jumped off to a quick three to nothing lead, but Pettit made some good pitches on him. This time he starts him off with a curveball and he hit it right back through the middle for a base hit. Olerud must be aware, if he wasn't before, about Pettit's move after he did Martinez in in the last inning. Well, we showed you a graphic that said he had scored, picked off 54 in six years. I think everyone should know. I'm still surprised that Edgar, he just, again, he's probably just lost his concentration for a moment. One and one to Bell, who hit 247 for the year with 11 home runs. Larry Boa flashing the signs. John Moses is the Mariner coach at first. We're in the bottom of the fourth. The Yankees lead it 3-1. to one. Two balls and a strike. Normally in this situation, Lou Pinella and his ball club would try to hit and run or do some things, but with Andy Pettit on the mound, it's just very difficult to try hit and run. Or to steal a base. It's just it cuts down on the running game completely. Olaru with a very short lead and easily back. And that was an honest move right there, a good move. And maybe the best move is the one that isn't quite so honest. Right, exactly. His 2-1 pitch. I mean, Pettit is throwing the ball well. He's moving the ball around, and this is another breaking ball down and in. And Bell way out over the top. Very tight rotation there. Looks like what he would call a cut fastball, but it has some downward movement as well. Bell lays off full count. Olerud is so aware of Pettit that Pettit actually has him moving back toward first base on the delivery. And now let's see what they do on three and two. Well, that's why it's so difficult to even hit and run like in the three-two count because he's going to get such a horrible jump that even a on a ground ball it can still be doubled up. And the other is you can be, he would easily be thrown out on a strikeout. Not going. A drive to center. Bernie Williams comes in to take it. He started back and pulled him off the bat. But he had time to close ground on it. One out. So Bernie started back and then he breaks in and he goes hard now this is one thing I like about Bernie it doesn't matter he doesn't time it just to get there he gets there in plenty of time to wait and make the catch good outfielders do that here's Oliver who singled in the second possible double play ball Soho to Jeter Martinez had to dig it out but they turn it 4-6-3 
The Mariners have little to show for their seven hits through four innings off Pettit. Soho, Brocious, and Knobloch in the Yankee fifth against Sealy. Ball one inside to Soho. When the Yankees picked Soho up, reacquiring him from Pittsburgh during the season, didn't seem like a monumental acquisition, kind of an agate type thing, but he's proved very valuable for them in this postseason, especially. Well, he has come in and taken over second base. He actually, Jose Vizcaino was playing a lot of second base, and then all of a sudden, here in the playoffs, Soho has been playing every day and doing a great job, both offensively and defensively. Inside, two balls and a strike. There's Ms. Caino, who is rivaling Dusty Baker for most fashionable eyewear in a big league dugout. In there, two and two. mclemore has been a busy man tonight. Soho's retired. And coming soon to NBC. Michael Richards is back on NBC as a private eye, along with Tim Meadows. The adventure begins. The Michael Richards Show premieres one week from Tuesday on NBC. Scott Brocious singled his first time up. Three for seven in this series. Strike one from Seelig. We saw that Pettit has started throwing the ball better in the last couple of innings. And now it, look, it appears that maybe Seely is starting to find his fastball and he's locating it well. And again, the fastball is what sets up everything for Seely. Pettit has a cut fastball to go along with his regular fastball. Seely basically a two pitch pitcher. Fastball at the knees, a call, strike three. The third K put in the book by Seeley tonight. And that's the third time that he has made a perfect pitch with the fastball. Look at this knee high towards the outside corner, right there. That ball actually moved back a little bit. Started off the plate and moved back right on the edge. And Here's Knobloch, who struck out looking and fly to right. Since the RBI double by Justice made it 3-1 in the third, Seeley has retired six consecutive hitters. Meanwhile, the Mariners have seven singles off Andy Pettit. They've stranded four. They've hit into a double play. They had a man picked off. Knobloch with a two-out hit. That's his fifth hit of this series. Anytime Seeley gets behind and they can sit on the fastball, they've been able to have good swings at it. He gets 2-0. and This pitch is pretty much in the middle of the plate. He's just trying to throw a strike. And that's what you should do because you don't figure Knobloch to hit the ball out of the ballpark, so you want to make him put it in play. Gives him a fastball in the middle. He lines it in the center field for a base hit. You'd rather have Knobloch get a base hit like that than to walk him. So good job by Seeley to make him put the ball in play. Knobloch, who was once a huge stolen base threat, upwards of 50 in a season, Stole only 15 this year. 15 of 22. Jeter is singled and grounded into a force play. And takes a strike.
Lock not going anywhere. That one's inside one and one. This would be a good time, you know, for Knobloch to try to get a lead at first base and try to get a jump and go. And he must make Seeley think that he's going because that'll help Jeter at the plate. Aaron Seeley is from Washington State, attended Washington State University. So that figured in his decision to come here as a free agent. Just as it did with John Olerud. The money being as big as it is these days. You wonder why more guys don't base a decision on that. When you get up into multi-millions, you can't spend it all. You might as well decide based on lifestyle and family and whether you like the manager. I guess increasingly that's the case, at least with some folks. The 1 1 pitch fouled off. What Seeley did there is he held the ball for a long time. And if you hold the ball on a guy that's trying to steal, normally he's not going to be able to get a good jump. He was just holding the ball, and then he fires a good fastball on the inside part of the plate. Jeter fouls it back. out and Knobloch's not going anywhere. It's not a bad move because it was a good time for Knobloch to try to get a lead and take off. But now you have to throw a strike because they can put a hit and run on if they want. The 2-2 two -two pitch. Off-speed pitch is hammered to left, but there is Henderson. Ricky may not have been 100% sure how many outs there were, but as his teammates begin to leave the field, he gets the idea, and he joins them. Well, the Mariners have had some opportunities to break through in the first inning. They had one of the second and third. Pettit makes a great pitch on Olerud to get out of the jam. In the second inning, Cameron's up. He makes another great pitch in on the hands, and he gets out of a second and third jam there. So they had a lot of opportunities early, and here in the fourth inning, Joe Oliver just hits into an ending inning double play. And now it's McLemore who starts it in the bottom of the fifth. And again, Pettit is throwing the ball much better now than he was the first two innings. Four men left on base. In addition, another runner erased on a double play. And Martinez erased on a pickoff. So it may be Friday the 13th, but Pettit has not been unlucky. If anything, it's been the opposite. He's led a charmed life, allowing seven hits through four, but leading three to one. But it hasn't all been good fortune, as you pointed out, Joe. He's made, despite whatever poor pitches he's made that got him into some jams, he's made good pitches when he's had to. Two and one. Pettit has been following a conditioning program somewhat like that of Roger Clemens, whom he idolizes. You might be able to tell if you've seen him in past years that he looks a lot stronger. He's filled out a good deal more. Big guy to begin with. 6'5", now weighing in at 215. Clemens has been able to prolong his career as a power pitcher through a determined physical fitness regimen. And Pettit has tried to follow suit. And being stronger keeps your legs stronger and allows you to keep your stuff longer. You don't get tired once you get around 80 or 90 pitches. Going with that game day stubble like the rocket. Fastball popped out of play. Still two and two to McLemore who laid down a two strike sacrifice bunt back in the second.
full count. Henderson next, and then Cameron. Well, the one thing that Pettit has been able to do anytime he goes to three and two, he usually comes in on the right-hander. He's done that every time with the cut fastball. He seems to have more confidence with the fastball in than he does any other pitch. Left that one out over the middle of the plate, but it's popped harmlessly to right. And taken by O'Neill. Now Ricky Henderson has got his third different stick in this ball game, which is what happened to him first time up. The black bat is shattered, switches to a white piece of ash the next time up, and breaks that one in half. And the second one was very important because all he needed to do was hit a ground ball someplace to get the run home. And he grounded it to third base. Well, he's got an even different model. He's got Edgar a different Martinez. model this time. Edgar Martinez. The other one, he's used three different types of bats. Would you switch off and use a teammate's bat during your career? No. I couldn't pick up most of them. <laughs> they were too heavy. No, I, I, I didn't think that that was a good idea unless you're really in a slump. You might want to do that just to change your swing. Did you like it if teammates asked to use one of yours? No. Superstition? Superstition, yes. Especially if I had one that was working. He's petted his throw. He's throwing a lot more pitches now than you would like. He's gone 3-2 to several hitters lately, and he's also fallen behind a few hitters. A line drive to right center field and very well hit. This ball bounces up against the wall. Ricky on his way for two and in with a one-out double. Edgar's bat worked. Yeah, but if you look at what Pettit has done, Oru got a base hit after leaving runners on. Now Ricky gets a base hit after leaving runners on. They're getting base hits, but not in key situations. Fastball up and out over the plate. And Ricky rips it to right center field. He had hit Ricky on the handle two times. This ball is hitting the gap in the right center. Bernie plays it well. That holds Ricky to a double. Leaving Cameron with an RBI opportunity. Mike's had an infield single and grounded a short. He's one for nine in the series, hit 267 for the year. Up and in ball one. Anderson at second with one down. Want to know the count to Cameron. Rodriguez on deck and then Edgar Martinez if the inning is prolonged. Two and up. And this is a situation where if you're Mike Cameron you have to say I'm not going to swing at anything inside corner or off the plate in. You have to say I'm going to wait for a pitch out over the plate. He's been able to jam Cameron with the cut fastball on the inner half, inner half of the plate. Big pitch here with Rodriguez waiting on deck. Swing and a miss. Threw it by him upstairs. If you get a hit pitcher 2-0, as the Yankees did with Sealy, you have to sit on a pitch in a certain area and try to do something with it. You can't go up and out of the strike zone. He was trying to get this cut fastball in. He left it up and out over the plate, and Cameron chased it. It immediately brought Posada to the mound. Now, with Henderson out at second base, it's possible they could have changed their signs, and maybe Posada was crossed up there. Didn't hurt the Yankees in any case. But he came charging to the mound right after the pitch. Well, it had to be something hard. He was either supposed to be a cut fastball or a straight fastball. Now the 2-1. 
A little flare over short that drops for a hit. Here comes Ricky, and that'll make it a one-run game. Seattle closes to within 3-2. Well, Pettit made another good pitch. He jammed him. But Cameron was strong enough to get it over the infield and drive in Ricky Henderson. Now watch, he's going to get the ball in again, which he's done on Cameron several times. Jams him, but he doesn't get the break this time, and that ball goes into shallow left center field, and it's a one-run ball game. And they're excited. Anytime you can get within one run, you always know you have a chance with one swing of the bat. At Yankee Stadium, the Mariners had only 12 hits in 18 innings. They have nine hits tonight in four and a third. Cameron's two for three. And he looked like he injured himself diving back into the bag. He calls timeout. It looks like he maybe hurt his right hand. takes a dive back and maybe jams his hand into the base. He immediately called timeout. That's a pretty good move right there by Andy Pettit. You can see he's crying out in pain there. Settles in. He singled and struck out. Another throw over, and Cameron gets back in standing. Andy Pettit, at this point, lined up as a Game 7 starter, if there is a Game 7, has now allowed 19 hits and 7 runs in his last 8 innings of work. He deals to Rodriguez. He hits a high fly ball that very nearly reaches the roof. Justice in left makes the catch. Nice play there by Justice. He was alive to the fact that Cameron was trying to tag up and go to second base. Man, he just missed that pitch. It was a fastball out over the plate, and he just got underneath it. Did he ever get underneath it? Well, he's looking to see if it's going to hit the roof. So now with two out and Cameron at first, it's Edgar Martinez who has single twice. Strike one on the inside edge. It appears that Pettit has a definite pattern with Edgar. He's going to try to throw the cutter in and just move the ball away. I he has to use both sides of the plate against a good hitter like Edgar. You can't just set up one way and, and stay there. Roll toward the middle. Jeter dives to smother it. Shovels it to Soho in time for the force on Cameron at second. The Mariners get a run and creep to within a run. It's 3-2 New York. Safeco holds about 48,000. Beautiful ballpark. And talk about a step up. The kingdom was just awful. Ugly. There's not a pleasing place in which to watch a game. Artificial turf. You should never play a baseball game on artificial turf. I mean, if that isn't clear to everyone by now, I don't know what would be. Or football. Baseball is even worse. <laughs> baseball is the more aesthetically pleasing game to begin with. Tap foul, strike one. David Justice, part of the order. In the sixth, he'll be followed by Williams and Martinez. And on top of it all, the place was a band box. And there are enough additional reasons why offense is up all around baseball. You don't need tiny dimensions. This place is just beautiful. A pleasure to watch a game here. Sealy jumps in front of Justice, 0 and 2. As he works here in the sixth, he trails 3-2. He's allowed the Yankees six hits. The Mariners have nine hits, eight singles and a double off Andy Pettit. 
but only two runs. Lou Pinella grabbing a bat just in case. 297 career hitter, why not? Lou Pinella's contract ends after this season in Seattle, as we've mentioned. They'll want him back here, but Lou has said, I'm going to play it like A-Rod, my shortstop. I'll see what's out there, then I'll make my decision. He is still a fiery guy and still able to fire up his troops. Justice goes down swinging. But, speaking of Manella, he is not as prone to the tirades, which were his trademark in the past. I mean, he used to throw some classic fits. Stomp, scream, hurl his hat, uproot bases. It could be rather entertaining, unless you were an umpire. This year, he was tossed out of only one game. The strikeout of Justice, meanwhile, was the fourth for Seeley. Brings up Bernie Williams, who's homered and grounded to second. Ball one to him. When you're talking about Lou Pinella, he told me also, he said that he watches the way other managers handle situations like Joe Torrey. Dusty Baker said a lot of the guys now they're handling this themselves a lot better. They're not as fiery and not yelling and screaming. And they seem to be getting better results. And he said also he's just mellowed a little bit with age. Well, he was always a very emotional player. And then, as we mentioned earlier in this series, having played for Billy Martin and Billy was such a specter at Yankee Stadium and you couldn't get away from his influence and his aura. When Lou first became a manager as a younger man in New York, some of that influence was felt. Managed the Yankees in 86 and 87. Then they, quote, promoted him to general manager when they brought Billy back as the field manager in 88. Then inevitably, Billy was fired at midseason, and Pinella came back to replace him. Two and two to Williams. Well, he's starting to get his curveball down a little bit. He struck Justice out with one. Now he gets this one right on the knees to Derek, I mean to Bernie Williams. And the count runs full. Seeley got a bit careless back in the second inning with Williams. Just grooved the 3-0 pitch. And Bernie rode the fastball out of here. There it is. Into the seats in right center. Now the payoff. Hit back through the middle for a one-out single. Good hitting there by Bernie Williams. He wasn't about to give in and give him another fastball 3-2, so he throws him a curveball, but he's trying to throw a strike with it. It's not his big hooking curveball. Watch. He's just trying to throw a strike with it. It stays up, and Bernie grounds it right back through the middle for a base hit. Seeley faces Tino Martinez, who followed Williams' homer in the second with a drive over the fence in the left center as they went back to back. Chris Chambliss, the Yankee hitting coach, has been counseling Martinez to take the ball to the opposite field more or back up the middle, which is the advice a slumping hitter hears so often. Don't try to pull the ball. Take it back up the middle or the opposite way. And that's helped Tino snap out of this slump. We've seen Seeley this inning also take a little bit off of the breaking ball. That pitch to first pitch to Tino was just a little wrinkle, more of a half slider, half curveball. But he was just changing the speed. Williams, the runner at first, is fast, but he's not a base stealer. He swiped 13 this year. Now Seeley comes to the plate and floats it in there for strike two. 
And let's take a look at this curveball from Sealy. That's a good one right around the knees. Martinez reaches for it, nubs it up the first base line. Seeley juggles it and has no play. It would have been a tough play as his momentum carried him into foul territory. But he had time to make it if he played it cleanly. Was well, in a perfect yeah. position if you're Tino Martinez to watch. He grounds it right down the line. Now he probably should have thrown this ball because you can see Martinez was running inside the line. But he didn't throw it. So you can't get an interference call if you're running inside the line like that and he doesn't throw it. But he couldn't get it out of his glove, so there was no reason for him to throw it. He wasn't able to. And it's a base hit. Two on with one out for Posada, who struck out and grounded out. The Yankees now with eight hits to Seattle's nine. Ball one high. Brett Tomko, who came over from Cincinnati, along with Mike Cameron and a couple of prospects in the Griffey deal, begins to get loose. And Posada skies one to deep right. Buner turning to the track in front of the fence. He's going to have room. Bernie Williams tags and moves from second to third. Tino Martinez remains at first. Runners at the corners with two out. And that's exactly where the ball carries best here. Straight away right field, straight away left field. And he just barely misses. It's a curveball. He gets underneath it. He hits it on the good part of the bat. He just gets underneath it. And just misses it because the ball will carry well straight away right field and Posada thinks maybe I got enough of it maybe and he's upset with himself for missing it Paul O'Neill who hasn't had good swings tonight he's 0 for 2 popped out grounded out 0 for 8 with a sacrifice fly in the series Inside and low. They wanted to check down at third base. John Hirschbeck says no. No way he swung at that. There's a fastball inside. And he just breaks down. He really didn't attempt to swing at it. Watch, he never even really starts at it. He just gets out of the way. Joe Oliver figured it was worth a try. Well, he could get a strike on his old Cincinnati teammate, Paul O'Neill. He's trying to add to a 3 2 lead in the sixth. 2 0. The Yankees have won three world titles in the last four years. They've gone to the playoffs six straight years, the last five of them under Joe Torrey. So Torrey has reason to be patient with and loyal to his veterans, like Paul O'Neill. Although he has dropped him down in the order to seven. Until Paul hits. If that happens at all in this postseason. He grounds this one foul. Every pitch in this situation is dangerous. Because if he makes a mistake and hangs the pitch. Even though Paul's not swinging the bat well. He can still get it up in the air at a right field. He threw him a 2-0 breaking ball there. Most of the Mariners pitchers in this series have tried to get Paul O'Neill out with a fastball. They figure he's been late on the fastball and they've thrown him a lot of fastballs. The 2-1. Hit hard through the hole. His first hit of the series produces a run. Williams crosses. Martinez stops at second. The hits are even at nine, but more importantly, the Yankees with a bit of breathing room leading 4-2. You see the target, they're trying to jam him again, but this pitch is out over the plate. He did not get it inside. And Paul O'Neill finds a hole on the right. 
And he hit that ball solidly anyway. Now Silva, who's grounded a second twice. Ball one inside. Tomko has been throwing. But for the moment, Panella sticks with Sealy. And that's a big run because the Mariners had just gotten one run closer in the bottom of the fifth inning. And right here in the sixth, the Yankees stretch their lead back to two runs. For a long time, the rap on Panella as a manager, if there was one, was that he burned out pitching stamps. Panella and his defenders countered quite plausibly with the notion that it was the kingdom that was burning out Mariner pitching stamps. The same way that Colorado managers have found it difficult to handle the Rocky pitching staff. Ask Don Baylor. Ask Jim Leland. Soho pops one into shallow right. The Yankees will score one and leave two. To the bottom of the sixth we go. 4-2 New York. But Paul O'Neill gets the base hit to put the Mariners down by two. And he gets a lot of encouragement from his first base coach, Lee Mazzilli. That's it, oh! What a look for pitch. Way to stay patient. That's it. Good job, buddy. So Pettit takes a 4-2 lead to the bottom of the sixth. It'll be Buner, Olerud, and Bell. Buner's 0 for 2. A high pop. Posada off with the mask. Brocious down from third. And Posada wisely lets Brocious take it. Brocious comes in and he takes charge. Right there he says, I got it, I got it. And Posada backs off. Now Olerud, who popped to short with runners at second and third back in the first, and singled in the fourth. Considering how many base runners the Mariners have had, the fact that Pettit has almost constantly been in jams, you wonder when there would ever be a use in this postseason for David Cohn or Doc Gooden. If they didn't get up and warm up in the third or fourth inning of this game, when would they ever come in? And it's a shame to see that at this stage of their careers. There's David. He's in the bullpen. One and two. Doc stretching. Actually, at this point, they're probably hoping that they do not have to pitch. That'll mean that Pettit's doing well, Roger Clemens. Olerud smacks one to center. Bernie Williams is there. David Cohn has been one of the great pressure pitchers of his generation. This year it all just fell apart for him. He could never find a groove at all. And Torrey stuck with him as long as he possibly could. Kept sending him out there, sending him out there, hoping that he would regain his touch. And while Dwight Gooden has had his moments over the past few years in both Cleveland and New York, been a long while since he was an overpowering pitcher, one of the game's masters early in his career. If you wanted to bet on somebody early as a Hall of Famer, you'd pick a guy like Dwight Gooden. It didn't turn out that way. A ball and a strike to David Bell. Two out, nobody on. Bottom of the sixth, 4 2 New York. And you really have to take your hat off to Andy Pettit because he has scattered nine base hits for the Mariners, and they only have two runs. I mean, it, they've had lots of opportunities to score runs, and he's been able to make the big pitch when he needed it. He hasn't walked anybody, which has helped. Two and two. He's had a couple of innings where he faced only three hitters because of a pickoff and a double play. But he has never had a perfect inning in this game. He set down the first two hitters here in the sixth. 
just thinking back on Dwight Gooden and the early part of his career, when he and Darryl Strawberry came to the Mets pretty much simultaneously, most folks thought they were looking at the premier pitcher and the premier hitter of a generation. Two certain Hall of Famers. A little pop into foul ground. Martinez has it. And Pettit has his easiest inning of the night. Back after these messages and a word from your local station. Really a beautiful arrangement here at Safeco Field with the threat of rain. They close the roof, but the side, as you see, is open, so you can still feel the night air. It's very comfortable in here tonight. Beautiful atmosphere for a game. Tomorrow it's Shea, 4 o'clock Eastern time on Fox. It's the Cardinals against the Mets. The Cards go with Andy Bennis. The Mets with Rick Reed. New York up 2-0 in that series. We're back out here, 4.30 Pacific, 7.30 Eastern time for game four of this series in Seattle. Paul Abbott, who was 9-7 for the season, pitches for the Mariners against Roger Clemens, who went 13-8 for New York. Brocious Knobloch Jeter in the seventh then. McLemore has that one eat him up and Brocious reaches to start the inning. Well Brocious goes the other way finally he's starting to swing the bat a little better and if he can perk up the Yankees will be in pretty good shape. Hits off the wrist of McLemore he tried to block it and knock it down but couldn't make the play. And it's scored as an error. <laughs> That's a tough error right there. And it brings Luke Pinella to the mound. So Sealy works six innings plus and leaves on the short end of a 4-2 score. Back to safety. Here's the March 1st game summary. The Yankees got back-to-back -back home runs from Bernie Williams and Tino Martinez in the second, an RBI double from David Justice in the third, an RBI single from Paul O'Neill in the sixth. Brocious reaches on an error to start the seventh, and that finishes Seeley and brings on Brett Tomko, who was 7-5 and five for the year, pitching mostly in long relief. He's been in the majors for four years, started with the Reds. This is the first time he's been in the postseason. They send Brocious in motion on the first pitch to Knobloch, but Buner's going to take it just shy of the track. And Brocious back to first with one out. I think that was a good situation. Try to get something started. You know Tom Cole's going to come in and try to throw a strike. He got the strike, but he hit it in the air. Aaron Seeley can only sit and watch and hope that his teammates can rally for him. Right now he stands to be the loser. This is Tomko's first appearance in this series. He worked two and two thirds and wasn't scored upon in the division series against the White Sox. Big swing and a miss by Derek Jeter. Fastball in under the hands of Jeter. And Tomko has a good fastball, and he just spotted that one perfectly. Foul back 0 and 2. Rob Ramsey, a young left hander they added to the postseason roster after Jamie Moyer was injured, is throwing in the Seattle bullpen. The next hitter due is the left handed swinging David Justice. And you're at the point now, if you're Lou Pinella, you can not afford to fall any farther behind. Struck him out. Well, he throws him three fastballs, one in under the hands, another one in under the hands, and then he throws one away. That one was supposed to go back under the hands, but he got it away, and he gets, strikes Jeter out. Tomko, as you can readily see, throws hard. The rap on him, at least from some scouts, is that on occasion he hasn't been aggressive enough. If you have that kind of fastball, why not come after hitters, as he did there? Well, especially right-handed hitters. Stays in for Justice, who hits one foul. 
And that ball really tailed in on Justice. It was a, looked like a cut fastball or something. But watch the swing at Justice. He takes his top hand off just trying to get to it. Way inside. And he just tries to get to it. That's what you call trying to get it out of your kitchen. He still gets jammed, but doesn't hurt his thumbs. And Tomko's 0-1 pitch has popped out of play. Justice has hit into a double play, delivered an RBI double, and struck out. This is a 96 mile an hour fastball off the plate inside. Good 0 2 pitch. Brocious is going. Here's Oliver's throw. A beauty, and they got it. Tremendous throw by Oliver. And Brocious is cut down stealing to end the seventh. Pitch was low. First, he had to dig it out. Did a good job of that. And right there to Rodriguez. The most prominent feature of the Seattle skyline. This is undoubtedly Andy Pettit's last inning. Jeff Nelson is up and throwing in the bullpen. Joe Oliver starts it against Pettit in the seventh. He'll be followed by McLemore and Henderson. 0-2. Pettit has been stretching his left leg like he's getting a little muscle cramp or something. He's been doing it for the last inning and a half. A little roller. Pettit up the mound can't get it. Broke his bare hands, throws, and gets him at first. Nice play there by Brocious. In fact, if Pettit would have been able to feel the ball, they would not have been able to make the play at first base. Ball is chopped. Now watch Pettit goes after it. Now if he gets it, he's running full speed the other way. If he gets it right there, there's no way. He actually lets lets it go. I think Brocious calls him off and he makes the play. Yeah, you could see from that angle that he purposely pulled back. And it must have been Brocious calling him off. So nice play there by the Yankees defensively. Good communication. Oliver may have strained something. Giving it all he had to try to beat it out. Here's McLemore. Bluffs the bunt, takes a strike. Well, Oliver looked like he came up a little lame there on trying to beat the ball out. One on one to McLemore, who sacrificed and fly to right. Strange outing for Pettit. He's allowed nine hits but only two runs as Nelson, the former Mariner, gets ready. He struck out only two, but he hasn't walked anybody. And he's made some big pitches when he's had to. The reason you have Jeff Nelson up instead of Stanton is because the top four hitters are all right-handed. Are the ones that Joe Torrey feels it can hurt him. Well, apart from switch hitters, the only left-handed batter in the lineup tonight is John Olerud. And he's several hitters away. There's Joe Torrey looking over the lineup sheet and the people that he has on the bench. Full count now to McLemore. Now 
Now, Canella has plenty of left-handed bats on his bench. Al Martin and Raul Ibanez, plus switch hitters Stan Javier and Carlos Guillen. Walking. First walk is issued. throws ball four outside and obviously he's not happy that's his first walk of the day Henderson becomes the time run at the plate he had only four home runs this year he doubled to deep right center his last time up and then scored on a Mike Cameron hit Way high. Now, one thing you have in Ricky Henderson, you know he's not going to chase pitches out of the strike zone. So Pettit is going to have to throw at least two strikes in this at bat. I think John Zimmer and Joe Torre are trying to decide whether to come get him or not. And out comes Joe Torre. Well, he wants to check. I think he's taking the umpire with him to check on him. As I said, I saw Pettit. It looked like something was wrong with his left leg. Trainer Gene Monahan is also accompanying Torrey to the mound. The fans boo because they find it suspicious. Well, I think it's legitimate because Nelson has already been up throwing. If they needed him, they're not stalling to get Nelson ready. He's already ready. But who says fans anywhere are logical? They're going to stick with him. Henderson at the plate. Cameron on deck. If this inning gets as far as Rodriguez, there's one out now. Had it will be gone at that point, almost certain. Well, that's what I think Jeff Nelson was getting ready for. Mike Cameron, Alex Rodriguez, and Edgar Martinez, because you're not going to pinch hit for anyone except for maybe Ricky Henderson in this situation. The 1 0 to Ricky. Swing and a miss. Whole lot of baseball experience right there. Zimmer and Torrey. Zim was making noise about quitting again during the season. So Torrey said to him, Are those aching knees of yours going to feel any better sitting in Florida than sitting in the dugout? Come on, stick out the season with me. Two and one. For his career, Henderson has hit Pettit well. Counting this game, 9 for 24. In the air to center, Bernie Williams waves O'Neill off, and there's the second out. Well, Pettit just decided he was going back inside on Ricky. He's broken two bats of Ricky's earlier in the game to watch he comes inside again and Ricky kind of fights it off and pops it up in the right field and Joe Torre is on his way to the mound. It's a moot point as to whether or not he was charged with a trip the first time out when he might have been checking on Pettit's condition because he'd already made his decision. He's taking him out and he's going to bring in Nelson to pitch to Cameron. Far from the best outing of Andy Pettit's career, but he was tough when he had to be. And if the bullpen can do the yeah. job, he's going to pick up his eighth career postseason victory. And they're leaving it up to Jeff Nelson. 
who will come in to pitch to Mike Cameron. Cameron has had some success against Nelson. He's two for six with a home run. And there you see Mike Stanton warming up in the bullpen. But the three hitters after Cameron, Craig, Rodriguez, Martinez, Buner, are all right-handed. And as he was in the first inning, Cameron very, he's the key guy in this inning. If he can get on base, he brings Alex Rodriguez up, who has hit 41 home runs this season, with Edgar Martinez to follow. Cameron's two for three tonight. Strike one. In Jeff Nelson's last appearance on the Safeco Field mound, he gave up a game-winning grand slam to Edgar Martinez. And that was the game that Pettit no-hit the Mariners for six innings and still did not get the win. He left with the lead, but Nelson gave up the grand slam to Martinez for the loss. Two quick strikes to Cameron, who had 19 home runs for the season. He's the tying run of the plate in the bottom of the seventh. Six foot eight inch right hander brings it home. The runner breaks from first, but it's a moot point. A call strike three on three pitches. He finishes Cameron and finishes the Mariners in the seventh. Still 4 2 New York. He's better than this for Jeff Nelson and the Yankees. Good morning, good afternoon, right in the middle, and then he chases the slider. He had one pitch to hit, and he didn't swing at it. That was there a fastball in the middle of the plate. I'll finish it for you. That was good night. <laughs> David Justice was at the plate when Scott Brocious was thrown out stealing to end the Yankee seventh. So he starts it here in the eighth, followed by Williams and Martinez against Brett Tomko. Olerud at first. Tomko covers, and Justice is retired. Well, you have to figure if you're the Mariners, you've got one last shot, obviously. You have A-Rod leading off the seventh inning with... eighth inning with Red Edgar, followed by Buner. And you're running out of time because Rivera will be on in the ninth. And unless you want to do something no one has been able to do for like three years, that score run off of Rivera, you better get something in the eighth inning. It didn't seem so big when they took a one nothing lead in both the series and the game to the bottom of the eighth in game two at Yankee Stadium. But in that game against Orlando Hernandez, the Mariners had many opportunities to add to the one nothing lead and couldn't get it done. Tonight, on nine hits, they've managed only two runs. They've had their chances, and they haven't hit with runners in scoring position, by and large, in this series. The same was true of the Yankees until their seven-run explosion in the eighth inning of Game 2. Really, the difference in the ballgame tonight has been the two big home runs. One by Bernie Williams, followed by Tino Martinez. I think that really gave the Yankees a shot in the arm right there because they, don't, they were down one to nothing when that started. To back up your point about this being an eight-inning game in all likelihood in terms of the Mariners' chances, Mariano Rivera is working on a streak of 31 and two-thirds consecutive scoreless innings in the postseason. The last time someone scored a run off of him was in 97 when Sandy Alomar Jr. hit the home run off of him. So that's almost three years so you, you, since someone has scored on To look at it another way, that's 22 playoff appearances without anybody scoring off Mariano Rivera. His career postseason ERA, 0.34, the best of anybody who's pitched 30 innings or more in the postseason. The one-two pitch to Bernie Williams. He checks the swing and the count levels. If there's one hitter who has really improved and looked really sharp tonight, it's Bernie Williams. 
He's laid off of a lot of tough pitches. He's fouled some off. He's hit the home run and he's also grounded a single back through the middle. So he's actually been at the top of his game tonight. And he had a big at bat in that eighth inning with the Yankees trailing one to nothing. He fought off several pitches as I remember and then took a 3 2 pitch into center field for the game tying hit and that opened the floodgates. Joe Torrey has seen this group of players do it often enough in big situations not to be impatient. Although they have caused him some anxiety in the latter stages of this regular season and in the playoffs so far. Another base hit for Bernie Williams, his third of the night. He's on everything. He's sitting there. He's not moving. He's just waiting and handling all the pitches. Now watch how he just stays there. Watch his head. He stays right on the ball, doesn't move, uses his hands on that inside fastball, and rips it to right field for a base hit. He has looked like a 360 hitter tonight. Tino Martinez, two for three with a homer tonight. Six for 11 in the series. He had three hits in game two. back easily even though Jeff Nelson is no slouch as you said Joe Seattle has to figure its best chances in the bottom of the eighth with Rodriguez Martinez and Buna but that's provided that Tomko can keep it close Owen two and we've seen Joe bring Rivera in in the eighth inning with one or two outs to finish up a ball game and this is a very important ball game for Joe. Tom Coach, 27 years old, 6'4, 215. His 0 2 pitch struck him out. Second strikeout for Tomko since he came in an inning ago. And coming up on NBC. Wednesday, Law and Order returns with a new season and a new DA. I'd like to hang their heads on our wall. Law and Order premieres NBC Wednesday. Posada's 0 for 3. 1 for 9 in the series. Batting now with two outs. And Williams at first. And this is one of those situations if you're Bernie Williams, you try to get a good jump and try to steal the base. When Brocious tried it in the seventh, Oliver's throw was perfect. Much of the crowd rises. Urging Tomko to finish things here in the top of the eighth and set the stage for a possible rally in the bottom half.
Here's the Morgan Stanley Dean Witter well connected play of the game. Bernie Williams and Tino Martinez each connected back to back in the Yankees second. Half of their runs in a game which they now lead 4 2 as the Mariners bat on the bottom of the eighth against Jeff Nelson. Rodriguez is four for ten in his career versus Nelson. Takes high and away for a ball. In this game, he singled, struck out, and flied to left. He's better than good. Strike one, one and one. When they try to get the ball club juiced a little bit here, the fan support, as Rivera gets up along with Stanton, they call it Soto Mojo. Soto standing for south of downtown, which is where Safeco is located. So the scoreboard often flashes Soto Mojo. Good pitch, one and two. No one has swung at Jeff Nelson yet. <laughs> He's making good pitches. He started A-Rod with a fastball for a strike. Now this is that little slider over the outside corner. Unleash the mojo. They'd better do it soon. Rodriguez lays off. Jeff Nelson has gone to the playoffs and or World Series the last five years as a Yankee, but he still says the greatest thrill of his career was being part of the Mariners postseason run in 1995 when they won that great division series here against New York. A little tap keeps him alive. If the Mariners mount a rally, as Joe Morgan said, Joe Torre will not wait before going to Mariano Rivera. Rivera had 36 saves during the regular season, and in 13 of those, he got more than three outs to record the save. Well, Jeff Nelson is very difficult for a right-hander to pick the ball up from. Full count. Well, A-Rod has done a good job to run the count for 3-2. All he wants to do is get on base for Edgar. Bouncer over the mound. Dieter to his left. Nice play. The great Mariners. And Rodriguez is aboard. And it was a nice play by but a lot of hustle by A-Rod forced Dieter to rush that throw. And I think Joe Torre is going to go out and argue that A-Rod turned at first base. And went towards second. You see Judah off balance throw, but A Rod may have beaten the play anyway. It's a nice play over the mound. He picks it. Now watch his throw. He has the throw running toward right field, so he throws behind Tino Martinez. And here's the question whether Jeter, whether A Rod makes a break towards second base. No, he did not. He just turned that way. You see the first base coach, John Moses, signaling to him, stay right here. The ruling is base hit because, as you said, Joe, Rodriguez may very well have beaten it, and there was no advance on the wild throw. Well, the question was whether he actually made an attempt toward second base. That's the question. And we did see him turn to the inside, but he stopped very quickly. Except for a small opening in the middle, the dugout is protected by a fence and a screen there. It was on the other side, the first base side, the Mariner dugout. And the ball hit that fencing and bounced back, preventing it from going into the dugout, which would have been an automatic advance to second for Rodriguez. Well, both Nelson and Edgar Martinez remember well what happened the last time they faced each other. Jay Buhner is scheduled next, a right-handed hitter. The switch hitter, Stan Javier, 
comes out into the on-deck circle. Martinez hit a grand slam here at Safeco off Nelson earlier this year, a game-winning grand slam. He's 3 for 11 in his career against the Yankee right-hander. Billy Connors, the acting pitching coach, in the absence of Mel Stottlemyre, on the phone to the pen. Martinez is 2 for 3, a pair of singles tonight. Ball one. There's Javier. Just about everybody in safe tone up on their feet. Inside two and up. They checked down at first. He didn't go. Most of the players up off the benches at the edges of the dugouts to get a better look. Well, if you want to get Martinez out, you run the fastball up and in as Nelson tries to do there, but it's off the plate, and Edgar was able to check his swing. There goes the runner on 2-0. Oh. Pisano doesn't have a play. Nobody even covered. The pitch was a strike, but Rodriguez strikes second in the process. So Rodriguez gets a great jump. He just takes off, and Nelson takes a long time to deliver the ball anyway. It's a breaking ball as well, down and away, and A-Rod easily in the second base. No one even breaks. As you see, they let him steal second base. Martinez had a career high 37 homers this year. Tying run at the plate with nobody out on the bottom of the eighth. In there. And that's the situation where Edgar didn't pick the ball up because that was a pretty good pitch to hit. He's not going to get a better pitch to hit from Jeff Nelson than that. That was a breaking ball that was pretty much in the middle of the plate. The 2-2 two -two pitch. Got him. Now see, he makes a good break pitch with the breaking ball. That, the second strike is the one that he let get away. That was a pretty good pitch to hit, but this one's a very tough pitch to hit. Breaking ball low, fastball up and in. Here's the breaking ball right out there on the edge for a strike. Comes back right down the middle there with a breaking ball. Now, this is a good breaking ball right out on the edge. So that was the best pitch that he had to hit, and he took it. And out comes Torrey. Gab yeah, Javier set the bat for Buner. Javier's a switch hitter. Rivera's out there along with the lefty Stanton. And it looks like he's going to Rivera. He's not going to fool around. Here he comes. Exit Nelson. Enter Rivera. Unscored upon in his last 22 postseason appearances. Now, I've always contended that there's an apples and oranges aspect to this, but there's no denying Rivera's greatness. All of Whitey Ford's scoreless innings came in World Series play in the early 60s, and most of those 33rd, 33 consecutive scoreless innings were complete game shutouts against the Pirates in 1960 and Cincinnati in 1961 and carried over to the World Series against the Giants in 1962. Nonetheless, what Rivera has done has been magnificent. And if he gets all five outs that he needs to close this game, his streak will be longer than Ford's. Well, he basically uses two pitches. He uses the cut fastball and the riding fastball, the four-seamer. And what has been so impressive is that he's always able to get that little cut fastball right in on the hands of the left-handed hitters. And Stan Javier has had a lot of success as success goes. He's had two hits off of Rivera. The first one of the switch hitter. Bounced foul. 
Javier has occasional power. He had five home runs this year. He's been around a long time. This is his 16th year in the major leagues at age 36. He started with the Yankees back in 1984. That was a pretty good pitch to hit. That wasn't a good enough cut fastball. It didn't get in on him, and it was down. That's the one that's so difficult. That fastball is up and moving in on the hands. And it's very difficult for left-handed hitters to lay off this pitch because it looks like it's a strike out over the plate, and then it just moves in at the last instant on your hands right there. You can see the rotation with it moving in. The 0 2. A bouncer to the left side. Brocious. Flips it to Martinez to retire Javier. And Rodriguez moves up to third. But with two out. And that just shows you all the weapons he has. He went with a cut fastball the first two times, and then he throws him a straight fastball right in on his hands. Now, this is just a straight fastball. This is not the cut fastball. This one gets there quicker than the other one. Right in on his hands. Now it's up to Olerud, who has seven career at-bats against Rivera with one base hit. And we saw the base hit the other night. A jam shot to left field. But with Olerud's swing, he's able to fight the ball off inside and keep the bat level enough that he can, can hit a line drive to left field. Down and in, 2-0. Olerud is 1-3 for three tonight. He had 14 homers during the year. He had 45 doubles. That's the kind of hitter he is. He batted 285. Rodriguez away from third with two out. And the 2-0 pitch is inside. David Bell, right-handed hitter, is on deck. They've got Al Martin and Raul Abanez available. Also Carlos Guillen, who can play third base and could replace Bell. Called strike. That was a situation where if you're Lou Canella, you I think you might have allowed John Olaru to go ahead and swing there. Three and oh, you may have gotten a pitch to hit, but he still made a good pitch right on the inside corner. Fouled off, full count. at home on three and two in the shallow left field justice is there Rodriguez is stranded 90 feet from home through eight it remains 4-2 New York new right fielder for Seattle as we move to the ninth Javier who batted for Buner stays in the game and plays right field Tomko remains on the mound. He'll face O'Neill, Soho, and Brocious in the Yankee night. Tomko has been impressive. He struck out three in an inning and two thirds. Sharply hit, Olaru to his right. Tomko covers nice and well. Well, if you're looking for something good and you're Paul O'Neill, he has been able to pull the ball the last couple of the bats, get the barrel out there and hit the ball hard. One was a base hit, and that was a sharply hit ground ball. And a nice play by John Olerud in the hole. And he gives it to Tom Coe covering. Which brings up Soho, who's wearing an 0 for 3 column. 
Ball one. Just in case anyone might have been wondering, had Olerud gotten a hit in the bottom of the eighth, and had the Mariners scored one run, that would not have ended Rivera's postseason scoreless inning streak because he inherited that runner. Now, obviously, as he comes out for the ninth, whatever transpires there is entirely his responsibility. One and one to Soho. I think this rattled Oliver's cage a little bit. Hello. <laughs> strikes well both teams have had 10 base hits the Yankees have hit the two home runs but they've also produced with runners in scoring position they've been able to drive in two other runs the Mariners had several opportunities early in the ball game against Pettit and couldn't get the job done that one finds its way through McLemore couldn't get it Soho's first hit of the night well, McLemore was playing him like a left-handed pull hitter well, Soho had twice grounded out to McLemore on the right side earlier tonight. Well, he gives him a lot of room up the middle, though. This ball is hit pretty much straight away, not even close to the back, so they were playing just way over in the hole. Soho's coming out, and Vizcaino will run for him. Well, Vizcaino obviously can steal a base, and a better base runner than Soho. Just in case Joe Torre wants to hit and run or do something with the base runner. And we'll probably see Vizcaino at second base in the bottom half of the ninth. And he's a good second baseman as well. He's a good glove man. He was a shortstop most of his career, but he's played second base very well for the Yankees. One down and away. Scheduled hitters in the bottom of the ninth. David Bell, Joe Oliver, Mark McLemore, all right-handed hitters. Check that. McLemore, a switch hitter. Scheduled to hit third in the ninth. After the Yankees scored seven runs in the bottom half of the eighth in game two, it wasn't a save situation, but Joe Torre, with Rivera rested, used him to finish the game in the ninth. Pitch out. This guy ain't not going anywhere. And Seattle got a man to third base with one out in the ninth inning, so they had a chance to, if nothing else, snap the consecutive scoreless inning streak of Rivera. But he got out of it with a comeback for the second out and then finished the inning, leaving the man stranded at third and keeping the streak intact. It's now reached 32 and a third. Call strike one. Grocious has also swung the bat well tonight. He had a base hit in the third inning, and he hit a one hopper at second base in the seventh. But they called an error and looked more like a base hit. Now this Kano goes. A swing and a miss. But Grocious now the bounces there, and he steals it. Well, Joe Torre puts the hit and run on. It's a low fastball. Grocious swings and misses. The throw bounces. And you can see Rodriguez wasn't able to control it. If he controls it, he's going to be able to tag this guy out. But it's a tough hop, and he's not able to come up with it. Leaving this in scoring position with one out. Rochus reaches for it and stays alive. He actually threw his bat at it and he got a piece of it to foul it off. The man down at second base, Jose Vizcaino, 
probably has no superstitions about this being Friday the 13th. Not a man who chooses to wear number 13. A high pop. Oliver back for a look. He has no play. What do they call that fear of a number 13? Trickstodectophobia? Our producer, Eddie Fibershop, contends it's Trickstodectophobia. And I'm sorry I brought the whole subject up. I am, too. Well, that makes two of us. <laughs> Case closed. <laughs> and we move on. Another 2-2 pitch from Tomko to Brocious. Full count. In any case, however it's spelled or pronounced, Vizcaino doesn't have it. Well, David Concepcion, my double play partner at Cincinnati, wore number 13. Not superstitious then, at no. least not in that regard. No. But the worst thing was I had to wear it on an armband once because he missed the All-Star game and I had worn it in honor of him. And how did you do in that All-Star game? A walk to Brocious. A walk. <laughs> one at bat and a walk? No, I actually, I, I was one for three in that game. So it didn't jinx 13, you. 13, I was 13, one for three. It didn't jinx you. Yeah. Here's the pitching coach, Brian Price, to the mound. Jose Mesa just now getting up. Well, Tom Coe has pitched well in this short stint. But he could be running out of gas. The left-hander Rob Ramsey was throwing earlier. It doesn't look like they're going to make a move here. With Knobloch the hitter and Jeter on deck. A reminder about tomorrow's baseball on Fox with Joe Buck and Tim McCarver and Bob Brenly and company. It's the Cardinals and Mets from Shea at 4 Eastern, 1 Pacific. Andy Bennis trying to give the Cardinals a fighting chance. They're down 0-2 against the Mets' Rick Reed. And then we're back out here late tomorrow afternoon, West Coast time, 7.30 Eastern time. Game four of this series, Paul Abbott against Roger Clemens. There's the rocket. Alongside Jose Canseco, who's greatly amused by Rogers' musings. Canseco's in uniform but inactive. They took him off the roster for the LCS and replaced him with the pitcher Jason Grimsley. Tomko wheels and doesn't throw. Canseco was on the active roster in the division series against his old Oakland ball club, but never got an at bat. tough situation for Canseco hit well over 40 home runs a year ago he's got in the vicinity of 450 lifetime he's been an MVP now a spectator and I talked to him today but he's in good spirits he says he understands which is 99% of the battle if you understand you can deal with it you can live with it former MVP alongside a five time Cy Young Award winner one and one to Nabla. Chuck is one for four tonight. He had a fifth inning single off Aaron Seeley. He was the first man Tomko faced when Brett came in in the seventh, and he got him to fly to right. Call strike two. Pitch 
Misses down and away. Oliver can't find it. Vizcaino sprints to third. And that could be a big play. And a good job by Vizcaino. You're taught as a base runner, anytime the ball goes toward the dirt, you take a step to the next base because if it bounces and bounces away just a short distance, you can still make it. So he takes off right away, and there's no chance for Oliver to get him. But Brocious at first base can't take off right away because he's not sure if Vizcaino is going to go, and he can't run him off of second base. So Brocious stays at first. Runners at the corners with one out. The infield has to come up. What they should do is almost play half. That way they're, they're playing where they can go for a double play. A one hopper to shortstop, you go six to four to three. A bullet through the middle and more breathing room for New York. This Gaino crosses, it's five to two. And that solved that problem. Now they've got to get at least three runs off a man who hasn't allowed one run in the postseason in three years. We get the fastball away and he drills it right back through the middle for a base hit. And this guy you know, comes in to score the run that should have been Soho's run, but he pitch ran for him. Soho got the base hit to start this rally. Throws the fastball past Peter upstairs for strike one. They may be a bit late to catch this train, but some of the fans are nodding toward reality and getting up and leaving. Down at least three runs with Rivera set to work the ninth. One and one. fouled out of play down the right field line. This is more like the Yankee team that won in 1999 and 1998. They keep a lot of pressure on you and they're able to play runs. I mean, they're going to leave a lot of runners because they get a lot of runners. But this is the team that's get one here, one there, and add a little power and they look like a good ball club again. The only Yankee without a hit, as you see, among their starters. Jorge Posada, who's gone over four. The one two pitch. Misses high. 12 hits for the Yanks, 10 for Seattle. But the Yankees have hit with runners in scoring position, and Seattle has not. Plus, New York went deep twice. Again, poked toward deep right field into the corner and out of play. That ball really carried down toward the 326 sign. Stan Javier gave it a run, but it was in the seats foul. Quite a contrast when you look at the dugouts. Just about everybody on the Yankee bench up along the railing. Nobody there for Seattle. The energy is all on the side of the visitors right now. Still two and two. There are the Yankee players standing up, as you mentioned. And there's the Seattle dugout. Most of them sitting down. Lou Pinella is the only one up and walking. He may be up pacing around after hours tonight, too. This has been a frustrating game to have as many chances as they had against Pettit and never be able to bring the hammer down against him. Full count now to Jeter. Justice on deck. 
There's your contrast right there. But as we said, even though they got a lot of base runners against Pettit, he made a lot of great pitches with men in scoring position. He broke some bats and had him reaching for his breaking ball away. The runners break, and Jeter fouls it off. So Brocious back to second. Knobloch returns to first. And Jeter settles back in in anticipation of another 3 2 pitch. A bluff by Tomko once again. There they go once more, and another foul ball. The pace has slowed considerably in the last inning or so. It seems it's almost impossible to play a Major League Baseball game these days in less than three hours. Joe, you're a Hall of Famer who grew up with the game. I've been a fan of the game my whole life. One of baseball's most endearing features, or most appealing features, was always its leisurely pace. But in recent years, that leisurely pace has often become a lethargic pace. The runners go again, and they'll come back again. I don't think there's any doubt that the game has slowed. You know, it's not about whether the action, it's about the things that go on in between. You have more hitters stepping out. You have more pitchers taking longer to get ready to pitch. It's just a combination of things. Plus, there are a lot more runs scored today than ever before, which also slows the game. You know, it's one thing if a 10-9 game takes three hours plus. Game one of this series was a 2-0 game. Ricky trying to catch a few winks, perhaps, and left. A 2-0 game that took three hours and 40 minutes. Game two was 1-0 going to the eighth, and that took about 345. Runners go again, and a check swing foul. Well, Frank Robinson was in charge of trying to find ways to speed up the game. And actually, I guess they took a few minutes off two years ago, but they've added them back this year. But I, again, I think a lot of it has to do with the run production. There's so many runs being scored in Major League Baseball that it's very difficult to play a quick game anymore. Especially in the American League with the D8. You have fewer easy innings. Tomko looking back at Brocious. Jeter making Tomko work. And the fans wait for the bottom of the ninth. Once again, the runners on the move. And ball four loads the bases. Lou Pinella has seen enough. Tomko was very effective until the ninth. Now he wants Rob Ramsey, the left-hander. You all know the drill by now. They change pitchers. We roll. Tomorrow at 2.30 Eastern Time, NBC Sports presents the 2000 Basketball Hall of Fame Enshrinement Ceremony. Six basketball legends will receive the honor, including our former colleague Zeke Isaiah Thomas. The Piston great, now the new head coach of the Indiana Pacers. Congratulations to him. That's tomorrow at 2.30 Eastern Time. And then with the Breeders' Cup Championship under a month away, at 4.30 Eastern tomorrow, it's the Breeders' Cup preview from Belmont Park. Highlighting this big day of stakes races is the Jockey Club Gold Cup and the Bell Dame. The Breeders' Cup preview tomorrow at 4.30 Eastern on NBC. Bob, it's good to see one of my favorite players, Bob McAdoo, go in as well with Isaiah Thomas. Close to unstoppable yeah. at his peak with the old Buffalo Braves. Ramsey to Justice, who cuts and misses with the bases juiced and one out at the top of the ninth. A run already home here to give the Yankees a 5-2 lead. Looking to take a 2-1 edge in the series.
Rip to right, base hit. One run home. Knoblock being waved in. The throw comes to the middle of the diamond. And that makes it 7-2. to two. Well, the Yankees are picking up right where they left off in the eighth inning in New York. It's a breaking ball, and Justice waits on it and rips it in the hole for a base hit. The throw goes toward third base. You see Jeter. Now, he makes a funny slide. I wasn't sure if he injured himself, but he seems to be okay. Now here's the slide going right into third. You see bounces up and catches the spikes on the base, but he seems to be okay. Meanwhile, the ballpark begins to empty out. Clay Bellinger comes on to pinch run, and he'll stay in the game and play left field for justice. Williams bats from the right side and takes a strike. So the Mariner bullpen, which had been untouchable until the eighth inning of game two, 15 consecutive scoreless innings in this postseason. Didn't do the job on Wednesday in the Bronx, nor, all things considered, tonight. Although Tomko was pretty impressive for a while. And I, I think he just ran out of gas, Bob, because basically he was using his fastball. And once you shorten your fastball against these types of hitters, they're going to be able to catch up with it. They couldn't catch up with his fastball the first couple of innings. Foul back one and two. Even though the lead is now ballooned to seven to two, Rivera is still in line for a save because when he came into the game in the eighth inning, it was a save situation. It was only four to two at that point. And if he's able to retire the Mariners without a run being scored in the ninth, he will still pass Whitey Ford's record, a postseason record of 33 score consecutive scoreless innings. Unless, like both of us, you make a distinction between those marks achieved only in the World Series and those that are combined achievements. Correct. But I don't think they care about what men you think because they, they haven't changed it and they call it a postseason award, postseason record. Evidently not. <laughs> And in a week or so, they won't have to listen to what I think, and they'll have less places to listen to what you think. <laughs> so what a relief that will be. <laughs> At least to some. <laughs> First and third, one out. And a full count pitch coming to Bernie Williams. Bellinger goes from first. Williams hits it high in the air to left. Ricky Henderson has it lined up. Jeter tags at third. Sprints for home. Bellinger retreated to first and tagged up and moved up to second base. It's 8-2 New York. Ricky throws to home, but the throw should have gone to second base. And one of the infielders should have been yelling at him to make sure he didn't try to get Jeter at the plate. He had no chance to get him. Great night for Bernie Williams. Three for four with a home run and now a sacrifice fly. You could look at tonight's game as an excellent argument for why a manager should, at least in some situations, be willing to bring in his closer before the ninth inning. The important outs in this game, as Martinez lifts one to center, which Cameron will take to finally end the top of the ninth, the important outs for the Yankee bullpen in this game came in the eighth, not in the ninth. To the bottom half, with New York up now by six, back after these messages and a word from your local station. Tied the game. Cleveland went on to win it 3-2, then they won game five. It was the division series, a best of five. They won game five to eliminate the Yankees the next night. Some might have been shattered by that experience. Rivera grew stronger. Changes for the Yankees. The two pinch runners from the top of the ninth remain in the game. Bellinger 
for Justice and left. Vizcaino for Soho at second. That's Al Martin. Who's going to pinch hit here in the ninth. Whatever tension might have existed taken out of this game by the four run Yankee ninth. Turning a 4 2 game into what appears to be an 8 2 lapper. Martin started the year with the Padres. He had many productive seasons prior to that in Pittsburgh. Mariners picked him up during the season. He hit 285 with 15 home runs. Batting here for David Bell in the ninth. Bob, it's just amazing to me to watch Rivera throw. I mean, he, he just rarely gets the ball in the middle of the plate. Everything is right on the corner. A chance for Vizcaino, which he gobbles up to take care of Martin. Panella to his bench once more as Martin sits down. Up comes Raul Ibanez. He'll bat for Joe Oliver. I mean, watching Rivera in the postseason, you'd wonder, you have to wonder how do they ever get him to blow a save? Look at that right on I me. Mean, everything's on the inside corner to a left handed hitter and everything on the outside corner to a right handed hitter. His motion is so fluid. The ball seems to just explode on the hitter. He gets up on top of you quickly from a hitter's perspective. You're right. I mean the free and easy motion and then he pops the ball and it just jumps at you. You would think that he'd make a mistake every once in a while over the middle of the plate, but he just seems to be able to get the ball right where he wants every time. And on top of that, he has great stuff. I mean, he's got an overpowering fastball and a great cut fastball. And a tremendous temperament. Perfect temperament. He's so at ease that he often naps during the early innings of the game. No joke. Goes down to the bullpen. You know, around the sixth, maybe. We won't need him before that. Has a little routine that he sticks with. You won't find his pulse racing in these situations. <laughs> a little broken bat looper that is grabbed by Jeter. The streak is now at exactly 33 consecutive scoreless innings. So he has tied Whitey Ford. Whitey's was 33 even, correct? Mm-hmm. So whether we consider the record separately or not, if he gets one more out, it'll be 33 and a third. And who knows how long it's going to go the way he's throwing. Well, if it's 33 and a third, in a sense, it'll already be a long playing record for those who remember the days of vinyl <laughs> prior to CDs. And this is what we're reduced to in an 8-2 game. Well, if you're the Mariners and you want to look at a positive spin, you know, put a positive spin on this, you say, well, we have two more games here at home. And if you can win both of those games, then you go back to New York and try to get a split. But they're still not hitting, especially in the clutch, and all of a sudden the Yankees are. That's true. The Yankees, who were within a few outs of suffering the indignity of back-to-back -back shutouts at home, got the seven runs in the eighth in game two, and now over their last ten turns at bat, they've scored 15 runs on 21 hits. Here's the 0-2 pitch. And it's going to get the victory. 
He worked his way in and out of several jams tonight before the bullpen came to his rescue. Another 0-2 pitch. Bouncer foul. The Yankee left-handed bats. Justice. Williams from the left side, a switch hitter. Tino Martinez are now suddenly hot. They can probably get to Abbott tomorrow. At least that's what Joe Torre is thinking. Well, they're definitely swinging the bats well, and we really watched Bernie Williams just sit there tonight, be in perfect hitting position, and hit the ball consistently hard all night long. And Justice always swings the bat well. And as you mentioned, Tino Martinez swinging the bat well. So they're the middle of the order does the most damage for the Yankees anyway. And when they're swinging the bats well, they're going to score some runs. Even Paul O'Neill, as you pointed out, dropped down to seventh in the order, had good swings his last two at bats in this game. Knobloch has been a contributor. Still can't figure out what's wrong with him in the field, but out of the DH slot, he's been very effective the past few games. Popped out of play. And McLemore hangs in. McLemore has only one official at bat tonight. He has a sacrifice, a pop out, and a walk. There's A Rod. Bouncing ball toward Martinez, takes it near the bag. The game is history, and Rivera has made a piece of history himself. 33 and a third consecutive scoreless innings in the playoffs and World Series. The Chevy player of the game is Bernie Williams. Three for four, including a homer, plus a sacrifice fly. The Yankees busted open with four in the top of the ninth. They win it 8-2 and take a 2-1 lead in the best of seven series. And the scary thing is, as you mentioned, Bob, the left-handed hitters in the Yankee lineup are starting to swing the bat. And that spells doom for any right-handed pitcher that goes out there on the mound. Mariano Rivera. As close to a lock as there is in baseball, especially in October. During this regular season, he was still very, very good. He was not as close to invincible during the regular season as he had been the past couple of years for New York. But in October, his mastery continues. Jimmy Roberts is with Bernie Williams. Bernie, three for four tonight. So many of the problems were offensive for the Yankees before coming in. Did the big inning in the game before have any contribution to what happened tonight with the run production? Yeah, I would like to say it did help. Uh, you know, it did help to boost our confidence. I think we came into this game uh, knowing that it was going to be a hard game. And we were grinding it, you know, up, you know, from the first inning on. And uh, we are, we're able to uh, score a lot of runs, and uh, it was just a great game for us. 23 hits in this, which is supposed to be a pitcher's ballpark. Can you talk a little bit about Andy Pettit's contribution tonight, which seemed to be pretty gutty? Oh, yeah, he was grinding it all, all, you know, all the way. Uh, he gave us his best, uh, and uh, he made great pitches when he needed to. Uh, and I just can't say enough about his performance today. All right, I'd imagine a sense of relief from the Yankees. Thanks for joining us, Bernie Williams. Bob, back up to you. Jimmy, thanks very much. So that's the story from Safeco. Tomorrow's game four, 4.30 Pacific, 7.30 Eastern time here on NBC. Paul Abbott, who is 9-7 for the year, will try and get the Mariners even. Roger Clemens, 13-8 for the season, but a guy who's had some difficulty in the playoffs so far, will try to give the Yankees the 3-1 edge. Again, our final score from the Great Northwest, the Yankees 8 and the Mariners 2. Tonight on NBC, following your late local news, it's The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. Jay welcomes comedian Drew Carey and the music of Macy Gray. For Joe Morgan, Jim Gray, who has nothing to do, so far as I know, with Macy Gray, and Jimmy Roberts. 
I'm Bob Costas. So long from Safeco Field in Seattle. We'll see you tomorrow night with Game 4. This has been a presentation of NBC Sports. So long, everybody.